Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Paleontologists Rank the Dinosaur Designs of Jurassic World Evolution 2. This week, we're featuring one of my personal favorite dinosaurs in the game, a slender-snouted, lightly-built tyrannosaur called Chinjousaurus. Before we get into it and see how they come into the world, I think we should briefly introduce ourselves for any new viewers to the channel. I'll start. I'm James Napoli. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in North Carolina State University, currently coming at you from an undisclosed location in rural Montana. <laughs> uh, my name is Amelia Zietlow. I am a PhD candidate at the American Museum of Natural History. I'm Scott Johnston, the vertebrate paleontology fossil preparator and technician at the Harvard University Museum of Comparative Zoology. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex Rubenstahl, a PhD candidate at Yale University. And hello, everyone. I'm Dalton Meyer, a PhD candidate also at Yale University. And together, we're the skeleton crew. We're the skeleton crew. We yep. sure are. Before we take a look at Chinchasaurus, I just want to remind you that if you like the videos we make, you should show that by liking the videos we make and by subscribing to our channel and clicking the little bell so you get notified when we make more videos that you will like. And also like. You see me winking at that the, the phrase like in this context? You should like our videos. It helps us in the algorithm. Please. With that said, <laughs> Dalton, let's Why take a look at this animal. All right. Here they come. Oh, we're getting the like Ooh, down review. Dramatic. Time, which is kind of fun. Oh, goodness. That's a very pretty one. I. What a good design. Wow. What yeah. a handsome creature. Give it up for Shinzasaurus. <laughs> I love Chinjasaurus. Chinjasaurus, if it were in a South Korean televised drama, would be the cool kind of intellectual and thin, not really villain character, but like, you don't know where their allegiances lie, but they're cool. <laughs> Somehow that sounds really well. I, I, well think, I think you're correct. Yeah, that was, that. was those were my feelings. I've been watching a lot <laughs> of, of Big Mouth. There's two Big of them Mouth. inside each other right now. Well, there are two Chinchasauruses inside you. <laughs> <laughs> you then die from blood loss. <laughs> um, so you, know, you know Mr. Hands. Well, this is Mr. Two, two fingered hands. These, this is this is bound to happen. We just gotta we gotta roll with it. Yeah. Roll yeah. with the punches. So, how it all um, so, dear viewer, this the construction vehicle behind me has stopped backing up. Which means that now I can talk about why I like Chinjosaurus so much. And there are two reasons. One is aesthetic, and we'll all talk about that later. But the second is scientific. What's really cool about Chinjosaurus is that it essentially proved that there's a distinct radiation of Tyrannosaurus that exists that has been overlooked for a very long time, due in part to the rarity of their fossil remains, and in part to earlier hypotheses about their evolution. Tyrannosaurs were first recognized in like the early 1900s. There were isolated teeth found in the 1800s. Um, like Cope and Marsh and Joseph Leidy had reported gigantic theropod teeth. Um, they referred to these as dinodont teeth, terrible tooth. But the first body fossils were found in the early 1900s with Tyrannosaurus and Albertosaurus being the first named members of the group. And as more fossils continued to be found, we got the impression that these were a very large bodied uh, clade of animals, right? They're characterized by extremely large body size, very, very large heads in proportion to their body, giant bone-crushing teeth, putatively high bite forces based on our simulations of their um, biomechanics. We've actually found fossilized Tyrannosaur poop, and we know it's Tyrannosaur poop because it's the size of a loaf of bread and full of ground-up bone. There's nothing else in existence that could have made that. And so we marks, know, right, too? Like, oh, and bite marks, right? They're just gouging bone. bones. Yeah. So I, thought you meant bite, I thought you meant bite marks in the poop. I was going to be <laughs> like, what? Well, when you said eat... They did. Uh, yeah, I, th I think it's worth just saying to those perhaps more uh, cynical-minded amongst our audience that it's not just modeling. There is there is evidence that they bite bone. Mm -hmm. Right. And they show adaptations that are similar to yeah. other durophagus or, you know, animals that eat 
tough material. Durophagy is a pretty wide umbrella spectrum term. It refers to any sort of habitual feeding on very tough matter. So animals that eat shellfish are considered durophagous, but tyrannosaurs seem to be doing something analogous to what hyenas do now, where they're carnivores, but they don't stop when they get to the bone. That's just where the party starts. And they will go right through the bone. Uh, Man, I, just I have my own reason. pet hypotheses about what tyrannosaur predation would have looked like. I'm, I'm going to save it for when we eventually talk about T-Rex on this series. Um, but I think it was absolutely horrific. I think if anybody saw a T-Rex hunting a hadrosaur or a ceratopsian in real life, I think we'd be in therapy for the rest of our lives. Um, anyway, we have all these big tyrannosaurs. Where did they come from? Well, for a while, we thought that they were just more carnosaurs, so large-bodied theropod dinosaurs writ large. Um, so Allosaurus was often considered the prototypical carnosaur, and the idea was that they evolved over time into these even larger and even more powerful predators. But as we did more systematic and formal phylogenetic studies of theropod dinosaurs, we actually found that Tyrannosaurs are one of the earliest diverging groups within the broader group Solorosauria, which is well known for being the group of bird-like theropods that contains birds themselves and other things that are more traditionally bird-like, like dromaeosaurs and troodontids and oviraptorosaurs. Tyrannosaurs seem to be the first major group of Solorosaurs that branch off. And we now know that their ancestors were actually quite small. Um, the earliest Tyrannosaurs are things like Proceratosaurus, Kaleskis, um, Guanlong. Dilong? Dilong is actually a little bit later. It's oh, not part of that yeah, early Yeah, a little later. Yeah. But it's, um, but it's also small. Yeah. Still tiny. You know, these are, these are like animals the size of real Velociraptor. They're not big predators. And they're present in like the mid-Jurassic onward. So the group originated early. They developed this adaptation well, that we used to recognize them. I'm sorry, Alex. What? I, like, they didn't really originate early. Right? Early they evolved or, around the same they're... time when, like, all Solurosaurs should evolve. But we just have a better early fossil record for them. Well, they right. originated I mean... far earlier than they had large body size. Oh, like, sure. it takes a long time for them to become what we think of Tyrannosaurs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. I mean, the really big tyrannosaurs are only really attested to in the Campanian and the Strictian. Like, they, they seem to get large only about 20, less than 20 million years before the dinosaurs go extinct. In the grand scheme of things, they're not huge predators for a long time. Right. Right. And early on, though, they did acquire a pretty good distinguishing feature of the group, which is that the premaxillary teeth, so the teeth and the bone at the front of the jaw, are D-shaped in cross-section, with one of the edges of serrations turned to the side of the tooth. D it's the kind of thing that's hard to understand it, like conceptually when you look at it, unless you're really holding the tooth. We'll put an illustration on screen to see if we can make it more clear. But the end result is that the front of the snout has these four very small incisor-like teeth that we think they used initially to scrape meat off of bone. The model in the I, game doesn't really. I, have I, it. I tried to zoom in to, to show us an example in game, but yeah, they didn't. They were they were unable to capture that, which I think fair enough. I think that'd be hard to do at this scale. I think so as well. What is cool is that the T Rex animatronic from Jurassic Park actually does show it pretty well. It's one of those cases where the people who made Jurassic Park just obviously did so much work that they actually capture a clade synapomorphy in pretty good detail in their animatronic model. I think that that's really cool. While we're in this camera angle, I wanted to compliment its teeth. That while it doesn't, while it doesn't have the characteristic D-shaped kind of incisor teeth that are characteristic of Tyrannosaurus right at the front, these are pretty dang good Tyrannosaur teeth. Yeah, they're a little rounder than other theropod teeth, and it seems to have the right number, right? More or mm -hmm. less. More or less. I mean, it's hard to know exactly which teeth are in the maxilla, but Chinchasaurus has yeah. 15 maxillary teeth. And this seems to have... Uh, 16? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. There should be one there. 14, 15. I think, I think 16, probably, yeah. So, yeah. fun thing that I learned in the couple minutes before we started recording... You know one has 16 teeth? Maxillary teeth? Allie Ramus. Yes. Wow. So it might be possibly one-off for Chingiosaurus 
It's right on for a relative, though. Doesn't the skull of Chinchosaurus that we have, the one the one skull we have, not have any teeth? I mean, we yeah. know that it had them because we can see the tooth positions. But I could see if, like, a, a, a like developer or artist was trying to make the skull, and they're like, well, this doesn't have any teeth. I'm just going to look at a reconstruction of, like, an Ellie Ramis skull and then just use that tooth number. So, Right, and I don't think that there were actually published photographs of the tooth row and when they would have had to be making this model. There was a recent mm -hmm. like high detail anatomical description of Chinchosaurus that came out. Amelia knows this well because not only was her undergrad advisor one of the authors on it, but uh, she just spent a lot of time making a wonderful skull reconstruction of Chinchosaurus that you should all buy on our Redbubble page, Bye. which no, is linked in the description. Like that, by the time we're through with that, that, that Redbubble is going to have just a lot of great, fun silhouettes for like a hundred plus dinosaurs. And don't you want to buy all of them Every as laptop stickers them. or as turn them into all sorts of things as Trading. sweatshirts, backpacks, mini skirts, shower curtains, a duffel bag, uh, nipple pasties. So Dalton's discussion of Ali Ramis is apropos because Ali Ramis was the only indication of this weird group of tyrannosaurs for a long time. The fossil of Aliuramus remotus was published in 1976, I believe, by a Russian paleontologist. It was a very incomplete skull, clearly a tyrannosaur, but smaller, much more lightly built. And this led to a lot of debate for years about whether this was a small and lightly built skull because it was a juvenile of Tarbosaurus, or if it was an adult, or just even if it was a juvenile, just a different species than Tarbosaurus. You would have thought the debate was settled when we found another Ali Ramis fossil in the Gobi Desert. Uh, I think it was discovered in the very late 90s, or early 2000s. It was published on by Steve Brusati and a number of other paleontologists associated with the AM and H at the time. Um, and, you know, a broader team, including uh, Tyrannosaurus specialist Thomas Carr as well, in a series of papers that described the fossil, with it being a series of papers because it was so high quality that it just needed a lot of work to fully describe it. Um, it's got a perfectly preserved brain case, perfectly preserved cranial skeleton, some of the postcrania. Um, it also pertains to a juvenile individual. It was given a different species name. Uh, it's called Aliramus Altai after the Altai Mountains in Mongolia. But because it was also a juvenile, it didn't show for certain that this group of dinosaurs did not were not simply juveniles of more normally proportioned tyrannosaurs, even if they were different species. So how did they determine that both of the Aileramus specimens are juveniles, given that there's only one known for each species? Right, that's a good question. So Aileramus remotus is known from a pretty fragmentary specimen. I think it was just identified as a juvenile mostly based on its relative size. Although there might be hindlimb elements that were sectioned at some point, I don't actually know offhand. Aliramus Altai had hind limb elements that were sectioned for histological analysis, and they confirmed that it was only nine years old when it died, and that it was in the middle of an active growth phase. However, an important point of that is that it was larger as a nine-year-old, or it was smaller as a nine-year-old, than other tyrannosaurs that have been studied with similar methods are at that age, which would indicate that it became, that doesn't prove, right, because growth can do weird things, but it does indicate that that was going to be a smaller animal than, say, Despletosaurus or Tyrannosaurus or, or even Gorgosaurus, that it was, you know, something small. In 2014, enter Chinchasaurus. So Chinchasaurus was not found in Mongolia like the other two individuals of Ali Ramus were. It was found in China in the Nanshang Formation, which has mostly yielded Oviraptorosaurus for some re weird reason. It's like we talked a little bit about the um, Shashimiao Formation in a prior episode um, when we were discussing Huayangosaurus, where everything's a Stegosaur. In the Nanshan formation, everything's an Oviraptorosaur, except for when it's a Tyrannosaur. And if it's a Tyrannosaur, it's either an in indeterminate scrap or it's Chinchasaurus. Huh. Chinchasaurus was actually found by a construction crew while they were doing the foundation work for a building. Cool. And thankfully, somebody like recognized that they were bones, and a museum got there right before a bunch of private collectors were going to. Mm -hmm. This story, according to uh, the rise and fall of the dinosaurs, where Steve Brasati recounts it. Um, because had it been gotten by unscrupulous individuals, it likely would have made it to the private market, uh, which would have been a black mark on the specimen and would have likely meant that no scientist ever saw it. But it wound up in a museum in now, China. For the, for the Oviraptors, like, 
just just it being over raptors is that something that has been proposed like could it be like is it a nesting ground or like they're not nesting they're like mired specimens mostly hmm. okay. so it's it seems to just i think it's just kind of one of those things maybe but okay. it, it is not sedimentologically incredibly not chidocta like and so i do wonder if it's something like a semi-arid thing that does seem to generally preserve over after so as well as well gotcha it's it's just hard to say i don't know too much about the non formation but if it's kind of chidocta like why do we not have this guy in a kind of barren scrubland like we did with Velociraptor. Well, we'll talk about that in a moment. But first, I want to talk about the fact that Ali Ray means for interest. Okay, fair. Also, because the Nanshan Formation is not Chidocta. Like, it's not a desert sediment, but okay. it is like a, it's a red sand. Okay, I was I was trying yeah. to give us a segue. No, I know, but I'm not done yet. So segue to my segue. Segue later. Yeah. Um, I want to segues. So. The discovery of Chinchasaurus is important for a couple of reasons. One, it's substantially larger than Ali Ramus, either species. Now, both of those are known from assumed juveniles. Chinchasaurus I, would be rare if it's a fully grown dinosaur. It's very rare that we find ones that had actually stopped growing when they died. But it's pretty clearly close to maturity. It being a fairly mature animal that is like Allioramus in a lot of traits is what indicates to us that Allioramus is not a juvenile of a more typical Tyrannosaur. This is its own group. And he leaves. <laughs> I'm going to take a very, very quick phone call. It will only take two minutes. Keep talking, and I can contribute when I'm back. Okay. So Alex has left us to rudely take a phone call because he doesn't <laughs> want to hear about the importance of Ali Raymonds again. But this indicates that Tyrannosaurs were not evolving only a one, along one axis, right? If you don't know about Ali Raymonds, it does look like Tyrannosaur evolution was this unidirectional trend where right at the end of the age of dinosaurs, they suddenly become very large macro predators that are specializing in the hunting of very large prey and osteophagy, bone eating. Allioramines do not have bone-crushing teeth. They likely did not have jaws and skulls that were strong enough to really bite through bone regularly. They're lightly built with really long limb proportions. They seem to have been fairly fast-running predators, especially compared to most theropod dinosaurs. They have these really long snouts. Chinchasaurus was colloquially known as Pinocchio Rex in the press releases that accompanied the paper. I very distinctly remember it being called Pinocchio Rex because I couldn't figure out how on earth to pronounce it. And to this day, whenever I'm trying to find information about Chingtosaurus, I can never get its spelling right, so I just type in Pinocchio Rex and do the do <laughs> name. And just copy and paste the name. <laughs> yeah, every time. Yeah, it, it, Pinocchio Rex is a good term for it. Um, one thing that it does show that's really cool is the presence of midline rugosities on the nose. So you can kind of see them if it ever stops spinning its head around. So you can see that there's these little hornlets on the middle of the snout. Mm -hmm. Tyrannosaurs in general seem to have had ornamentation on their snouts, but in most tyrannosaurs it's bilateral. It's rare for the ornamentations to be popping up along the midline like that. That's a specialization that unites Chingerosaurus with Allioramus, Remotus, and Alta. And the Allioramus specimens have it pretty exaggerated, right? Allioramus, it's even bigger. Yeah. yeah. Um, Chingiasaurus also has really large lacrimal crests. It, Tyrannosaurs in general tend to have big lacrimal crests, but in Chingiasaurus, they are even larger. Uh, they're just massive. And they're shown here covered in a lot of keratin and exaggerated even further. So... The group is this long-snouted, lightly built, probably fast-running group of tyrannosaurs, and they're showing that there's a tremendous degree of evolutionary experimentation going up right until the dinosaurs go extinct. Uh, with this group that is very poorly represented in the fossil record, apparently existing at least in Asia, we don't yet know of any in North America or any other continent. It might be something that was endemic to Asia that originated quite late in the Cretaceous. It might be something that became much more common over time. Had the dinosaurs not gone extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, we wouldn't really know what groups would have succeeded in a Cenozoic that had not had a KPG impact event. It's possible that Allioramines were a group that were going to be very successful 
but were had their lifespan cut short. It's possible they're just some weird ecomorphs that developed in Asia. It's possible they were widespread and we don't really find their fossils anywhere. So I think the inclusion of Tringesaurus in this game is really cool because it is a good way for a popular video game to show a fairly recent fossil discovery that essentially revealed an entirely new evolutionary radiation of pretty familiar and well-studied dinosaurs. And I think it's a great way to try to disseminate more knowledge of it to the public. So I love Chinchosaurus in this game. Um, I love Chinchosaurus as a real dinosaur, and I love its depiction here very much. So, love that. That's a great social animation. I, I love the, like, the calculated moment. When it like, thinks of it. Just, yeah, it's like, this... I could hit his flank right now. <laughs> was this in the, um, is this in the base game, or was this like a... This is base. Yeah. It's, base game. It's, it's both okay. based and in the base game. So it's right. not like part of the deluxe thing or whatever? No. No, the nope. deluxe was, the deluxe was only four animals, two of which we've already featured. Um, it was Attenborosaurus, uh, Hoyangosaurus, for some unknown reason, um, Pachyrhinosaurus, and Geosternbergia. Gotcha. Mm. Right. Right. Hwangosaurus is really the deluxe baseless stegosaur. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Great. do we want to return to an abandoned Segway? As one might grab one of those like rental scooters that would you find out, uh, find out and about in major cities, and you just go up, grab it, and get on. Yes. I, I see an abandoned Segway time. left left out in the sidewalk, and let's let's get on that and go for a ride. Why are we featuring this in a autumnal deciduous environment? I think the mm -hmm. proximal reason we're doing it is that prehistoric planet put Chinchasaurus in an autumnal forest in what is, without a doubt, the single most convincingly animated segment of a non-avian dinosaur I have ever seen in my entire life. It's like, so good. Listen, listen. I I like prehistoric planet a medium amount. I think it's a good show. I It didn't, you know, I think it's very well animated. I like, think it's an artistic triumph. I think it's pretty good. I think that the special effects were really good. I think that the Chinchasaurus that was featured in that was an actual animal that they found when they were out on a walk in, like, you know, forested China. And they just recorded it with their cell phone and put it in the documentary. No, Because yeah. my brain refuses to accept that it's a special effect. Yeah, I know, that I, makes sense. Yeah, I, I can't believe it. To say about... It's... Realism, like how effective designs are when they're featured, when they're like incorporated into a complex environment. Yeah. Right, like, right. A for, like I'm thinking of Avatar, right? And like, <laughs> are you laughing at me? I'm no, 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 no. It was just, it, uh, the goat one of them being was just, just obliterated oh, in the background. Right. <laughs> but just like, like I think of the, the shots where like the things in prehistoric planet look the most fake and they're usually very, very good. But our big open shots where it's things in deserts where I'm like, that look, I can tell this is a model. But if it's like something that's forced to be in like, like dappled in shadows, they're like complex objects for it to have to move around. Like my brain is like that, that's real. The only exception with this is the pterosaurs, which I don't understand how they do that. Uh, yeah. So, Especially the, um, what was it, Barbarodactylus? Yeah. yeah, that's just again like a real pterosaur they saw. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they were, they were just climbed up that mesa and they were like, holy shit, there's a lot of real pterosaurs up here. We better record this shit. They're doing what um, they're doing what Julia Lacerda does for pa and passes off for paleo art is that he just has a time machine and a really good camera and goes and takes pictures of dinosaurs and then says that he draws <laughs> them. Uh, and I, right. he can't keep getting away with it. And like I think James Cameron has a spaceship. He flew to Pandora. Exactly. Right. This is actually happening. The following is documentary footage from the planet, or the moon Pandora of the planet Polyphemus. Um, What's the planet's name? Polyphemus. Polyphemus. Cool. The, um, the Chinchasaurus in Prehistoric Planet, right before it lunges at the Caritha Raptor to kill it, its pupils dilate like a big cat. Oh, it is, shut up. It is remarkable. You can see it doing the cat expression, and then the pupils get real wide, and then it goes. It is There's just insane. There's a lot of life in that. I watched that entire show basically waiting for that segment because I was so blown away when I saw it in the trailers, and I wasn't disappointed. Which I just... It's the forest one, right? It's the fifth one. It's mm -hmm. all the way in the last. Um, and last. it's only a few minutes, but it's just remarkably effectively done. So, so anyway, as we said, that was the primary reason 
that we did this in the autumnal forest to ape a popular documentary that people like so that people will click on our video. Homage. But there is, is a the scientific term. reason to do it too. And I now, because one of us knows about plants and it isn't me, I'll stop talking and the one who knows about plants will start. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that would be me. Um, so the reason we've chosen, uh, the other reason we've chosen to show this animal living in a forested ecosystem is that uh, a little bit earlier we talked about um, the diversification of tyrannosaurs. Um, and this just happened to coincide with the diversification of another group of organisms, and that is that of the flowering plants, the angiosperms, um, which are today the most diverse group of plants alive with about 300,000 species, which is absolutely bonkers. Um, and yeah, I know people tend to not think of plants as changing and part of the environment in the same way that animals are because the changes aren't as immediately obvious uh, to the casual viewer. Uh, so for example, angiosperms are the main kind of plants that change color in the fall. So this entire forest here is almost entirely, I guess, almost entirely uh, angiosperm plants because gymnosperms, primarily nowadays, uh, conifers don't lose their leaves or change color in fall versus other trees that do that are angiosperms. Um, so there's debate about whether the diversification of flowering plants was the cause of diversification of animal groups. Um, so not only did tyrannosaurs go crazy during this time in the Cretaceous, um, but many other groups of dinosaurs uh, diversified, uh, such as the duck-billed dinosaurs, ceratopsians, um, what else? I don't know. Uh, you see generally like um, it's a bit more granular, but you kind of tend to see the more dominance of ankylosaurid ankylosaurs mm -hmm. as opposed to notosaurid ankylosaurs. Um, right. You start to see more diversification in like pachycephalosaurs. And I think you, you get pachycephalosaurs. I think I think you get them, and you kind of lose for the most part the early like marginocephalians. So the things that are like on the pachycephalosaur and ceratopsian line, things like they're like stachysaur type animals. You don't get those as much. Um, you lose the guanodonts, that's a big thing. Yeah, you lose big, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, you, you seem to lose most of the big, like, Carcharodontosaur um, predators. That's not so much a global phenomenon, but... And sauropods, yeah. too. And sauropods. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, so it may make sense that this uh, change in the, in the animal fauna corresponds to this change in, in plant fauna. Um, because again, angiosperms, the flowering plants are very, very different. Um, from all other known clades of plants in the fact that, not necessarily because of their flowers, but because of the fruits. So other kinds of plants don't produce fruits in the same way that flowering plants do. Um, so fruit, a fruit is basically uh, the ovary of the plant. So it's a structure that protects the seeds that have been fertilized and it aids in their dispersal. Um, the reason it helps or aids in their dispersal is that animals like to eat the fruit and drag them all over the place. Um, and leave them. Or also some fruits aid in dispersal via wind or other methods. So think of helicopter seeds. Those are technically fruits from fr uh, from flowering plants that helps in their dispersal. So it's beneficial to the adult plants to get their offspring as far away from them as possible so that they don't have to compete with one another uh, for sunlight and space and resources and all that. Um, if you get sticky burrs on your clothes, that's another kind of specialized fruit. Um, so again, the fruit isn't necessarily like an apple, uh, but it's a, it's um, the developed ovary of the plant that's main purpose is to protect and disperse the seeds. Um, so if these angiosperms are diversifying and becoming more abundant in the ecosystem, it would kind of make sense to assume that the animals are diversifying because of this new food resource and because of these new um, this, this new component to their ecosystem. However, the catch to that is there's not only this diversification on land during this time, but uh, marine animals are also uh, undergoing a, a critical change during this time. And what that is, is there's a reduced abundance of plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs, and we see the rise of mosasaurs. Um, so this suggests that there's actually something going on globally, not just in terrestrial ecosystems, but um, in other ecosystems as well. Uh, what that may be, I have no idea because I don't study that, uh, but it seems to be a global phenomenon rather than something that's restricted to the land and thus 
not necessarily uh, due to the advent of angiosperms. So another piece of evidence that would argue against angiosperms being the cause of this is that there's not any clear evidence from the fossil record that their diversification is temporally correlated with the rise or fall of any of the groups of terrestrial animals we've talked about. It's all mm. happening within a pretty big window of time. Uh, the Cretaceous terrestrial revolution is commonly defined as occurring from 125 to 80 million years ago. So there's not a documented correspondence of the plant fauna changing in concert with the dinosaur fauna, which would indicate that the plant fauna is not driving the changes in the dinosaur fauna. So mm. I think that this probably speaks more to the idea Amelia brought up, that it, it is some sort of global systems change that is facilitating a lot of evolution occurring. And we're just seeing, you know, we're seeing a lot of change in that time and it's not causal, it's everything being the symptom of the same underlying cause. Yeah. There's some promising research that I can speak just a little bit about because it's not published yet, uh, but it's being done by a, a very, very good paleontologist named Lucas Weaver. Um, and what he's looking at is suggesting that around the time that all of these turnovers and uh, diversifications are occurring, you're also seeing an increased amount of tectonic activity globally and an increased amount of mountain building. And what that's doing is it's fragmenting habitats because mountains act as barriers to dispersal. And by fragmenting habitats, you are essentially, in essence, creating more isolated populations of various organisms that then have the opportunity to diverge and um, speciate and kind of become their own things. And so there, there very are likely global extrinsic forces to the biosphere that are contributing to all of these changes that we're seeing over this time interval. Um, and I guess one thing that I also think about is that this is also a time where we don't have a whole ton of rocks that produce fossils. So one of the big mysteries about the whole Cretaceous terrestrial evolution is um kind of understanding what's happening during it because we have a really good picture of what's happening before and a really good picture of what's happening after and that's giving us the idea that all these changes occurred like we know that all these changes are occurring in ecosystems uh, but because we have a, like a 40 million year gap it's hard to say how rapid that change was, was going on and what the dynamics are in there and, and that gap may be kind of artificially um making this seem like more of a rapid turnover than it maybe really was, but you know, we don't know. Right. I mean, especially in North America, we go from like a pretty good fossil record in the Jurassic to the early Cretaceous. There's like good Aptine Albion, the Cloverleaf Formation. And then, so that's the, those are a couple stages of the early Cretaceous. And then you've got a pretty substantial gap that starts to develop um with a couple of geological intervals being almost unrepresented in north america with terrestrial deposits right you've got almost nothing in the coniacian or turonian or santonian and then the record picks back up in the campanian stage at about 80 million years ago with the most diverse dinosaur fauna that we have evidenced anywhere in the world mm. it's actually temporally correlated with the really good deposits in the gobi desert in asia so you have this huge gap in basically the northern hemisphere and then all of a sudden the record comes back in and there's entirely different kinds of dinosaurs everywhere. And so that definitely gives the illusion of while there was a gap, like while we weren't looking, something happened. And I dropped my cell phone, catch it with my left hand because I'm skilled. <laughs> while I wasn't looking, my phone dropped, but I caught it. And it took what 40 million catch, years. <laughs> what we didn't catch was the diversification of all of these dinosaur groups, which we do not see. And um, so, you know, when you say well, while I'm not looking, something changes. So that's when everything happened. You know, as Dalton said, it's easy to not, it's easy to forget that we're essentially missing 40 million years of Earth's yeah. history, which is like, what is that? Like the Oligocene to the present? Um, Earlier no, than that. It's, it's the Mid-Eocene to the present. Yeah. Right. So it's, so it's, it's like almost saying, the entire Cenozoic. If right. you were to like, if you were to think about it, right? If you, if you, if we had no idea what was happening for most of the Cenozoic, we go from, we have the Pele, uh, the, uh, uh, the Paleocene, and then a little bit of the Eocene. We have enough of the Eocene that we have like a proto horse, like one of the early horses, some like, like a brontothere, a brontothere, a few things that look like uh, alligators that are artiodactyls, might be whales, uh, and then you jump to uh, you know maybe let's say the last two million years of the fossil record. We know a lot of stuff's happening in there, but when's it? Is it all happening at the same time? What, what's what is it like 
and that's right. kind of the situation we're in with, with this mid with this uh mid period of the mid cretaceous where it's just like it's it's happening but what does it look like yeah what turns out turns out if you cut 40 million years out of out of the life history you can lose a lot of things in there and it's i don't want to in that example say like we don't have anything but like the the periods that are represented uh the the places where this time span is represented are frustrating in that they're often in kind of geographically separate areas right so like the Cenomanian is really well represented in africa well it's very well for, for the Cenomanian. there are good representations of it in africa and argentina but we don't have good representations of like the earlier Cretaceous from these places, uh, at least for dinosaur fauna. And then kind of the later Cretaceous is, is pretty spotty too. So we're like, well, we know in the Cenomanian that we have these down here, but we also think that the continents were separated at this time. Like there was not faunal e exchange happening. So it's hard to say like, it's hard to use those areas of the globe to inform the evolution mm -hmm. of, of clades we have from the, the rest of the Cretaceous and Laurasia. So. Right. And Amelia's also mentioned that the marine environments are way better. Yeah, what you mean, like in terms of the fossils that we have? Yeah. Yeah, like they're not stellar, but we do kind of have a more steady or a more, at least a, a somewhat more solid record of like 100 million years ago because that's for for my group the mosasaurs that's where we're getting the really goofy early things like the agyalosaurs so like we have them and we know about them but we don't have very many of them hmm. so but we do yeah. have them which is better than not having them and then i know about some other basal mosasaur things that are unpublished that are also from that window of time so at least for that group that period of time is not as bad in terms of having fossils um but yeah yeah i think one of the interesting things about this period in earth's history is that it is to some degree the final assembly of like what we consider a modern fauna mm -hmm. right we talk a lot about the triassic as being the period where the earth's terrestrial fauna really sets because we get the origin of a lot of the major groups that dominate to today like the earliest squamates the earliest um the earliest crocodile well like all of the major groups of the family tree that are still the major groups are appearing they're not the yes, original, the final I, I would argue that the formation of a of a modern fauna is really what's happening in the early jurassic right because like a fauna right. is a composition not just what occurs and the triassic is like there are modern fauna but there's also all that weird shit that didn't die oh so much weird shit yeah right then... there's this is not this is something that has been stated before but like the I think it is like the late Triassic is the emergence of right. modern, like the modern fauna. It's it's whether whatever your opinions on are, are are or not. It's like in, if not the literature in in like the uh, certainly the, the greatest. It and is think, kind of what has been said. And it's important to note that it's the modern fauna, not the modern flora, because again, like most of our ecosystems today mm -hmm. are dominated by angiosperms, which did not show up until the Cretaceous and didn't diversify until the mid Cretaceous. And I, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. <sighs> it's okay, take care. I don't know, like I, they're very important and a lot of animals today rely on them heavily, including ourselves. Like most of our food and medicine comes from angiosperms. Yeah. Like yeah. life as we know it would not exist without flowering plants. Right. And so I think the mid Cretaceous or the tr Cretaceous terrestrial revolution is really important on this front because you know, even if the major groups that are the major players are originating in the Triassic, the Triassic is kind of the like the backstory movie. It's the prequel, right? You get to see what all these characters were like when they were younger. The mid Cretaceous is to some degree when a lot of this is happening. This is the Sopranos to the many it's saints. The many saints of yeah, goddamn. I was gonna say, yeah. you know, you get young the many Guido. saints of the Newark Super Basin. Um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna say that again with the correct term. It's the many saints of the Newark Super Group. <laughs> and um, the Cretaceous is when all of this is happening. The way that might best explain it is that two things. One, dinosaurs are still supposed to be here. They are still here. Birds are the, like the major group of terrestrial vertebrates in terms of species count, but squamates is a very close second. Um, had the asteroid not hit the Earth, it is almost certain that dinosaurs would still be the dominant terrestrial vertebrates. 
And they would probably be dinosaurs very similar to what we have in the Cretaceous, just with more evolution developing them. So they might be bigger, they might be a little bit different, but we'd probably still have Tyrannosaurs and Ceratopsians and Hadrosaurs in North America as the dominant thing. The second is that if you went back to the latest Cretaceous, the Earth would kind of look similar. Mm. Whereas if you go back to the Jurassic, you are going to see very alien types of ecosystem that are dominated by gymnosperms, right? The reason they set prehistoric planet in the latest Cretaceous is because they could actually film it on Earth now without having to recreate the environments using CGI because they wanted the environments to be a realistic depiction. And the thing, the the weird thing is, it's not just gymnosperms because we could have recreated that on Earth today if you just go to a conifer forest. Conifers are gymnosperms. Um, so gymnosperms means naked seed, and that has to do with the fact that their seeds are not enclosed in a fruit. They're usually in a cone, but not always. Like ginkgos, which we talked about in the Triceratops video, I believe, are have like this weird kind of pseudo fruit structure. Um, but the important distinction is that the structure or the the part of the plant that's forming the, the 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 berry is not the same as it is in a flowering plant um and so although there were a lot of those around a lot of gymnosperms around during the triassic and cretaceous um most of the plants at least especially early on were actually spore plants so spore plants don't even have seeds much less fruits um and these include ferns horsetails and lycophytes um, and these plants grew to be much bigger than they do today. The largest spore plants alive today, I believe, are the tree ferns, which are ferns that grow in a tree form uh, because trees are not a real group and they're just a body plan for plants. Um, and so the consequences of this on the ecosystem is that spore plants have a very different life cycle from seed plants. So if you really want to if you really want to go down a fun plant biology rabbit hole, look up the alternation of generations. Um, plants do this weird thing where if they were any other organisms, we would classify two members of the same species as different species because they alternate through di having different body forms uh, in which they have different numbers of chromosomes. Um, and so the spore plants, their version of this, of this alternation of generations is that both generations or both forms that have the different numbers of chromosomes are independent so they can live on their own. Again, this is a large rabbit hole with lots of fun, crazy, confusing details to it. Uh, but the gist is that it is nothing at all like we have today in our angiosperm dominated ecosystems because these plants are fundamentally different. And also, again, they don't have seeds. So there's just a completely different set of interactions that the animals can have with these plants that's very different than the interactions that they have with gymnosperms and angiosperms. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and horrifying. I, I, oh, I yeah. read to think of like, I'm sure they they know what they're doing over there in like plant phylogenetics, but I, the whole concept makes me very nervous. This is why one of my advisors actually at Carthage, because I have simultaneous interest in plants and paleontology was like you should be a paleobotanist and i was like there's no way i have the patience for that because not only do plants undergo alternation of generations where you can have like i it's it's i'm getting overwhelmed by how stupid plants are again um they're very cool and that's why i like them but like so not only do you have alternation of generations where different individuals of one species have wildly different body plans and lifespans and numbers of chromosomes and all of that jazz, but also on individual plants, you can get different shaped leaves based on how much light they're getting. Um, you can get different shaped leaves on a single species, just depending on where it's living, how much light it's getting, what other plants are around it, what other animals are around it. Um, plants are, in my opinion, infinitely more complicated than animals could ever dream to be because of all of the variation that they have not only in their physical bodies but also in the numbers of chromosomes they have because sometimes they can just hybridate uh, hybridize instantly and have four sets of chromosomes which is just wild um i remember talking to a plant molecular systematist about this and like apparently accommodating plants and how they even do it algorithmically has been like a decades long challenge that they finally finally figured out ways to resolve but yeah. it's exactly what Alex is saying. Like, it's just, they are a different group of life, and that doesn't mean one's a plant and one's an animal. They're yeah. a different kind of being alive. I remember yeah. at GSA, uh, we saw 
I, what I thought was a really interesting talk that was given like by a paleobotanist who's trying to resolve like because apparently different parts of the same plant were given different taxonomic names because you'd find them as separate fossils for a very long time mm. like this was she, this paleontologist she was trying to like figure out what was the same plant and she was using um, she was looking for like things that were invariable but she was talking about like stomata size variation and I just remember coming away from that talk being like paleobotany seems really hard yeah that's I, unimaginably hard to me <laughs> there's a reason where the skeleton crew and not the leaf crew right <laughs> now um, yeah there's there's one thing i would like to say which is i think we should rate this animal now um now is a good time to know while we have a loading screen that this is also the only dinosaur i've ever paid for commissioned art of uh by the wonderfully talented friend of the channel henry sharp henry is uh just an absolutely unreal artist. I think he's got a particularly good ability to capture like texture, and th you know his things just look real in a way that very yeah, little paleo art does. An incredible life to it. Yeah, and uh, I'll flash the art I commissioned from him right now. It was actually a gift from my younger sister, who also is a big Chinchasaurus fan, and uh, it's good stuff. Should we plug his shit? like follow him on Twitter at like the yeah absolutely we are plugging him right now, but. Definitely go follow him on Twitter, ArtStation, Instagram, everywhere he's got socials because his stuff's just unreal. Consistently good. And, and it's mean, even better because he gave us free uh, unlimited use of it in our videos and we're definitely going to abuse that. And he's also, um, Thanks. Not, not to spend too long on Henry, but he's, also, he's not just a paleo artist. He is a young researcher as well. Yeah. He's, yeah, he's doing some really, really cool research and he's a, he's a smart guy and a nice guy. And we like him. And very, just very cool and pleasant. Yeah, Alex and I got incredibly drunk with him in Canada, and it's one of my one of the better nights I had in 2022. Let's rate this dinosaur. Let's rate this dinosaur. I like um, this powder blue. Yeah, it's gorgeous, right? That's nice. Yeah. All right, I'll start. I love this animal. I particularly love the weird, like, almost Asian dragony design influences on it. This is something that. You could probably talk about a lot more if you were a cultural psychologist or sociologist, which I'm not. But I'm going to say, I do think, I do wonder to some degree how much paleo art is informed by cultural expectations of like what a big lizard looks like, which to some degree is going to go back to the dragon myths that like Western versus Eastern cultures have inherited. Yeah. Right. Western dragons began as snakes and I think have always been a little bit more grounded in terms of like what we actually see in the animals right now because they started in that way. They, Eastern yeah, dragons I mean, have always had a much more chimeric design element to them and look a lot more ornate and fanciful. They're more influenced by fish too, which I feel like right. yeah. gives like, well, yeah, I mean, like big the, displays the, and the lungs, right? That's the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that the term for the Asian the Asiatic yeah. dragons? I believe so. Chinese, right? Yeah, but they're they're. I mean, I think part of it's probably in like the significance of of the dragon. And I think they're only really called dragons because, like, it's a big reptile thing. Right, right. I mean, it's yeah. a different thing. Right, because in, in European and in European mythology, they're very, like, because they're kind of coming from the snake, they're very often antagonistic figures. Whereas in, uh, at least to my limited knowledge, they're more deific. They're kind of more like deities and, and or, or powerful kind of spiritual figures in, in Eastern mythology and stuff. I think it's there's a lot of cool stuff about dragons and like even in Europe because well they start from snakes but like in local cultures they're more mammally like the Nord mm -hmm. the Nordic dragons have a lot of features of bears in them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean there, we could do a lot of episodes about design influences on dragons, but I guess what I wanted to point out with this one is you can given that this is a Chinese tyrannosaur, it seems a little bit appropriate that it seems to be taking some of the display and ornamental design cues more from eastern dragon designs than from western dragon designs which are typically influencing dinosaurs and it's something i like a lot about the design it feels like it was drawn by somebody and stylized a little bit but according to a particular cultural tradition that matches where the animal comes from and i, I like that um in general i think it's an absolutely killer design i think it looks great i think it sounds great i think it acts great i think it's gorgeous i like that it reminds me of timothy chalamet and uh, I think that this is, um, and the reason that it reminds me of Timothy Chalamet is that it gave every other dinosaur in my park chlamydia. <laughs> S tier design. Do we include that? We have I don't to. Know. He's I don't too big. Sued. 
by we're not going to get sued. Poetry. That's all over social media constantly. What if Timothy Chalamet watches our content? And he's like, "Hey, this if you if if this line you. if this joke prevents me from getting onto the set of Dune Three, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a fit." Is all I'll say. He'll, he'll call James, and James will have a hard time hearing his whispery British voice. He's like, "What? He's American. You know, he's from New York, right?" <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. That man went to high school in Queens. Oh, that's destroyed me. <laughs> it was the only way you could get through it, like thinking he was a British person. Get through what? Like get through his popularity. Life, Life yeah. <laughs> No, I just, f I had no idea why I assumed he was British. You know, he, I mean, he does British fairly convincingly, but he's American. He's also younger than all of us. Yeah. yeah Is he I really? Yeah. I don't want to talk, focus on that. <laughs> I think he's younger than you, Amelia, but he, you might be the only one who's younger than him. Acker Canvas right, well, popped up, which means that I'm sorry, Dalton's I Googling it. Was... December sorry, 27th, no. 1995. Yeah, no, so no, you're, you're younger than him. Yeah. He's Wait, younger than me. Born? He was born in '95. Yeah. yeah oh yeah, Alex, you were '96, weren't you? Yeah. Uh, he's older than you, but he's younger than me by months. He's younger than me by months too, and I don't like it. Anyway, in any um, case, Amelia, you react to the design now. <laughs> um, I as as we've all said, we like this design very much. I like that it's got like they've all got built-in eye shadow. I don't know if it's like a shadow effect of the horn or if it's actual pigment, but I like it a lot. Um. It's very pretty. It moves very nice. The animations are great. And I don't think we said this, but I like that um, as for some of the other designs, it's like a very good Jurassic Parkified design mm -hmm. of an animal um, where you can tell what it is, but it also has, you know, its own character to it, uh, which I like. And I particularly like this, this blue color on it. Um, so I will be giving it an S. I am right off the bat also going to give it an S. I think it's absolutely stunning um i like the noises it makes too we don't talk that uh, that much about the the different calls and stuff that they make but i kind of like its little like weird bellows and things uh it's social animation's fun i always I, i've always really liked the kind of almost friendly ones that uh some of the theropods have in this game it really like shows their animalistic side of the and, and by that, I mean, these are just animals and they do animal things. Um, it's a it's a fun animal and they did a really good job with it. It's very good. But I don't know if it's my favorite Tyrannosaur in the game. But? Oh. Yeah. But. I don't know. There's I, I said this. There's something that's kind of like goofy about its appearance and i think that's not the fault of any design it's just it's built like that built goofy they were kind of goofy animals mm -hmm. they weren't built different they were built goofy the, the the scales on the back are so cool i'll say yes there's no need to be a contrarian about a cool design <laughs> yes and it is an s for me as well i don't have anything to add that has not already uh, been said except i guess to say for the future, because I noticed it as I was looking at it in this angle, it does hold its arms and palms in the correct orientation. Oh, um, yeah. Which pretty much all of the non-movie model theropods do, if I'm remembering correctly. And even some of the movie model theropods have been changed to do that. So that's a nice a nice addition. Um, yeah, it's an S tier. It's S tier. Right with Styracosaurus and Attenborosaurus. And JP2 and three raptors. That's good company up there. Indeed. And now it's time to see what other company is going to possibly get put up there and spin that, that wheel. wheel. Woo! Huzzah! This is on Dalton's, right? Yeah. Well, no. Who's the wheel spinner? Um. RK Ornithomimus. Okay. Oh, oh no. Hey. <laughs> All right. So join us next week, everybody, when we talk about a dinosaur that was only used as a joke in one Jurassic Park movie 
to illustrate the point that nobody who wrote the script gave a shit about dinosaurs or really likes them at all. Um, because the only thing to say about Archaeonicomimus is apparently that it's hard to say, which is funny because it's not even that hard to say. There's way harder dinosaurs to pronounce. <laughs> there are far harder dinosaur names to say, like Euplocephalus, apparently. <laughs> um, join us next week when we talk about Archaeonicomimus. It will probably be a short episode. As always, remember to like and subscribe so that you get notified when our next video goes up and our channel can continue to grow and attract new viewers who just want to see a bunch of paleontologists hanging out and talking about dinosaurs. So thank you for watching, as always. Check out our Redbubble if you want to buy a Chinjasaurus sticker or duffel bag or miniskirt. And we'll see you next week. We have one woman in the audience, and I want her to buy the miniskirt. We, we actually, no, wait, I probably know all of the women in the audience.